Uh, so let me start by uh, thanking the organizers. Working, perfect. Thank you, yeah. All right, sorry for the technical problems. Yeah. This is morning. Yeah. Yeah, says record. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Wait. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Everything working. All right. So um. Right. So okay. So uh. Uh. Today I'm going to talk about uh some recent work uh on uh topological state uh in in modern sitters. And uh, this is motivated by uh, recent experiments on uh, semiconductor Mori systems, but the theory I'm going to talk about uh, is hopefully uh, in more uh, general. So uh, yeah, let me first uh, acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, the theory work is done uh, with two postdocs at MIT, uh, Yang Zhang and Trisop Debeko. And uh, we are fortunate, uh, fortunate to collaborate with experimentalists at Cornell, uh, Jie Shan and King Fan Mac. So, um, <clears throat> So um, yeah, let's start with some basics about modeling sutures. As we all know that uh, it's a, a prime example of a strongly correlated electron system uh, when there's a, a strong uh, on-site on repulsion at the filling of one electron per site. Uh, the band theory would say the system has to be metal, but repulsion makes it into an insider. Uh, at every side, there's only a single electron and the spins of electron can do interesting things. But as far as charge degrees are concerned, uh, this is a, a very simple uh, state, okay? And uh, the uh, modeling sort of can give rise to many interesting phenomena when, for example, you could dope it, uh, it can turn into a semiconductor uh, at a higher temperature, there may be a pseudo gap state, and all this uh, is uh, motivated by the, the study of modeling sort is strongly motivated by high temperature uh, semiconductors or cuprates. And um, at very different kinds of electronic states is a topological insiders and uh, uh, for example one of the earliest example of a topological insider uh, is this Hodan uh, model on the honeycomb lattice and uh, Hodan introduced uh, complex hoppings uh, that microscopically corresponds to uh, loop current states uh, on the honeycomb lattice and he showed that this state actually supports a quantum Hall effect without any external magnetic field and um, and this quantum non Hall states uh, has uh, one-way moving edge states uh, on the boundary, uh, despite the bulk has an uh, insulating uh, gap. So this kind of a topological states is fundamentally different uh, from an atomic insider. And one way to see this is that uh, chiral electrons on the edge uh, cannot be uh, cannot be localized. So this is very different from the case of an atomic insider, from the case of a model insider, where electrons are localized at uh, uh, sites both in the bulk and on the boundary, okay? So the topological states uh, uh, cannot uh, be fully localized uh, everywhere. And um, this quantum non state was experimentally observed about 10 years ago uh, in magnetic doped uh, topological insiders. And you see this quantization of the Hall conductance uh, without any external magnetic field. So, um, so I'd like to highlight the fundamental distinction between these two uh, different states, the model insider and topological insiders. And I think the distinction between the two really represent uh, a fundamental dichotomy uh, between the particle and the wave aspects of electrons. The modeling insider is understood from the point of view of particles, from the point of view of real space, while topological insiders are naturally described in terms of the waves, coherent uh, block waves in a periodic medium. And, uh, and, uh, right. uh, and, and also, uh, Another fundamental distinction between model insider and quantum non hall insider is that uh, in a model insider, the magnetic order is usually antiferromagnetic. So um, <clears throat> there's no global breaking of time reversal symmetry. If you perform time reversal followed by a translation, uh, the state is restored. While in the case of the quantum non hall state, the chirality of the edge states requires a global breaking of time reversal symmetry. And in the case of magnetic doped TIs, uh, the system is ferromagnetic ordered. Okay, so the magnetic impurities uh, in the thin film topological insert order ferromagnetically, and the sign of the magnetization 
uh, whether it's pointing uh, in the plus or minus z direction, that determines the sign of the Hall conductance, whether it's plus or minus e square of h. So all these um, differences makes one wonder, uh, one may ask <clears throat> that not modern topological states are not only distinct, distinct but <clears throat> is there conceivably any <clears throat> direct path between the two phases? Okay, so what I mean here is the following. Uh, imagine in the uh, phase diagram of, uh, of uh, all possible uh, phases, uh, the, uh, is there a direct transition, a continuous direct transition between a mod and quantum loss hall state without additional uh, fine tuning? Okay, so, um, so we know, for example, this kind of question, uh, you can, no, we know that in the case of a topological banding sphere and ordinary banding sphere, such a direct transition, continuous transition uh, is well understood. It's described by a massive direct fermion with a mass changing sign. Uh, and uh, we also know that uh, to, uh, as far as I know, uh, there is no such direct transition, uh, at least I don't know any, between a fractional quantum pulse state and a ordinary banding sphere without any fine tuning. So the question now is that uh, imagine I have a time reversal invariant system with an odd number of electrons per unit cell. We know there are uh, one type of states, which is a mod insulating states. And we know that in principle, it can also realize a quantum non hall state at the same feeling. So the question is, can we tune the system in some way to achieve a continuous direct transition between the two by only tuning one parameter? Okay. <clears throat> so um, I was motivated to think about this problem uh, by the recent experiments from the Cornell group. And uh, um, the experiment is done on uh, two layers of the transition metal that charge tonight, uh, monolayers, uh, MOT2 and WSE2. By itself, these are just ordinary semiconductors, nothing uh, fundamentally so interesting, but putting them together, you can use electrostatic gating to uh, uh, achieve a feeling of one hole per unit cell, per Mori unit cell. And uh, remarkably, uh, by tuning the electric field between the two layers, a transition from a mod insular to a quantum mass hall state uh, was observed. Okay, uh, both layers are non-magnetic semiconductors, and yet uh, it can give rise to a uh, quantum mass hall state uh, spontaneously by time reversal symmetry. So, <clears throat> what I'm going to describe is a theory for a continuous transition uh, between the two phases, uh, and this phase transition is described by a universal. Uh, effective field theory, uh, and uh, uh, instead of dealing with a square lattice, uh, and we know that these TMD systems uh, have uh, you know, three, four rotation symmetry, it, it has a triangle lattice symmetry. Okay. So um, first, let me uh, give you some basic information about these uh, TMD systems. A monolayer TMD, such as uh, MX2, uh, these are large gap semiconductors, and uh, uh, near the, uh, for example, conduction the valence band edge, the dispersion is simply uh, parabolic. And, uh, and we're gonna deal with, for example, whole doped WSE2. So uh, the only interesting, uh, the relevant states are near uh, the uh, band edge. And the band edge is located at both K and K prime that degenerate related by time reversal symmetry. Uh, because of the spin orbit coupling, uh, there's a, a spin splitting. So at a given uh, value, uh, the spin is polarized. And the two values has opposite spin polarization due to time reversal. So, uh, so together, together they form a, 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 a spin full uh, system, uh, you know, combining the two values K and K prime, uh, they form a, uh, a 2D uh, whole gas with a, a relatively large uh, effective mass on the order of electron mass. And this um, large uh, effective mass leads to strong interaction effects, uh, even in a monolayer MOSE2, uh, we crystal state was observed without any external magnetic field. And uh, that's because RS is large uh, at, uh, at this density range on the order of 10 to the 11th. And uh, uh, this uh, experiment actually measured the external energy spectrum uh, in the system as a function of the carrier density. Okay, so when the carrier density was introduced, external would interact uh, with the electrons and uh, to form the so-called trions. And as a result, the external energy uh, showed a blue shift. And this uh, is shown by the red line here. Uh, and this is well understood, but interestingly, at low density, you see that an additional uh, feature appears, a second exton uh, 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 peak appears. And uh, it turns out by uh, detailed analysis in this uh, work from the ETH group, uh, they show that uh, 
this additional uh, exon uh, peak actually is come from the Bragg scattering of the exons from the uh, electron uh, Wigner crystals. And uh, uh, so this uh, is uh, evidence of the Wigner crystal states. And um, the physics of the TMD is getting uh, even more interesting when you consider uh, stacking two layers of TMD together. And uh, uh, when the two layers have a lattice mismatch or has a finite twist angle, uh, you introduce a long wavelength uh, periodic structure that's called the Moray superlattice. And it was uh, first proposed by Allen's group uh, in 2018 uh, that these systems uh, may be uh, an ideal realization of the uh, Hubbard model. And the idea is actually very simple. Uh, again, think about this, for example, the TMD uh, uh, bilayers WS2, MOSE2. Uh, and this can, because of the fundamental uh, uh, work function difference between the two layers, uh, low energy carriers uh, in this case uh, only live on the WSE2 layer. And the role of the MOSE2 layer is basically to introduce a, uh, a periodic um, uh, modulation of the structure. And this leads to a periodic modulation of the valence band edge. And, uh, and this can be modeled uh, as a super lattice uh, potential uh, for the carriers in the WSE2 layer. So what we have here is really the simplest example of Moray band structure described by a uh, free like, hole in a periodic potential. Okay? And when uh, the Moray period uh, is large, the characteristic kinetic energy at the Brown zone uh, boundary uh, is uh, small. It can be made arbitrarily small uh, if you go to small twist angles uh, in the case of the homo bilayers. And uh, in this example, the Moray period uh, reaches on the order of 10 nanometers. So the kinetic energy uh, scale is very small. And uh, in this uh, regime, when the kinetic energy is small compared to the uh, potential energy, then uh, the system really uh, behaves uh, just like an, a periodic array of uh, quantum dots. Basically, you think about the periodic potential, each potential minimum uh, provides a harmonic uh, trap for the carriers. And uh, uh, so the system behaves as an array of quantum dots uh, weakly connected by tunneling between these potential minimums. Okay, and this naturally leads to a tight binding description. And once you include the uh, repulsive interactions, uh, it leads to a Hubbard model. So um, following Allen's uh, proposal, the experimental groups at the uh, Cornell and the Berkeley, uh, they actually uh, studied this WS2, WS2 uh, uh, semiconductor heterobilayer. And indeed they observed uh, characteristic uh, physics of the, uh, of the Hubbard model. So shown on the left are the resistance uh, measuring transport as a function of the feeding factor. You see at the feeding factor of two, when the first Mori band is, uh, is completely filled, uh, you get a banding sweater uh, shown as a resistance peak, but even more prominent is what half fitting, okay? Uh, because of the strong uh, upper repulsion, uh, the insulating state appears, uh, and that insulating state is a modding suit. okay? And uh, the Berkeley group uh, observed not only the modding insulator, the banding insulator, but also insulating states at fractional fitting fractions, uh, including one third and two thirds. And again, these were uh, quickly understood as um, generalized Wigner crystals, basically you take uh, the uh, limit of the kinetic energy goes to zero. Uh, you have charges on the uh, triangle lattice. And the, once you include uh, the on-site repulsion as well as first neighbor repulsion, then uh, the uh, uh, crystal states uh, will form at one third and two thirds filling. At these fillings, you can avoid the nearest neighbor repulsion. And that's why uh, these Wigner crystal states are favored. And um, by now, uh, many more Wigner crystal phases have been observed at other fittings, and all these can be understood by just the extended Hubbard model on the triangle lattice in the uh, strong coupling regime. Yes, please. Right, so RS here is uh, on the order of, so it depends. So in the case of this uh, experiments uh, on uh, MOSE2 uh, in the electron conduction band, uh, the mass is heavier. The mass reaches on the order of 1.5 electron mass. And in this case, RS, I think, is on the order of 30, 20 to 30. Uh, in the case of the, um, the, uh, the WSE2, the effective mass is smaller. So, uh, so in these systems, uh, RS, I think, is only of order 10, if I remember correctly. Yes. So the fact that you see a Wigner crystal at such RS is, again, telling you that this is not just a, a Wigner crystal in free space. Okay, These are actually Wigner crystals pinned by the periodic Mori potential. Uh, and these are all incompressible states. 
uh, if you have a winner crystal without any pinning effect, it's actually a compressible state. If you change the density, the uh, winner crystal period just changes continuously. Well, in all these measurements, uh, there's capacitive measurements clearly show that these are uh, there's an incompressible uh, gap at these fillings. So these are incompressible winner crystals pinned, strongly pinned by the, by the lattice. So it's sometimes called generalized winner crystals. Yes, Max. Next slide. Yes, next slide. Okay, good. So another uh, important feature of model physics is that uh, uh, once modeling instance is formed, the charges are localized, but the spins are, are active degrees of freedom, and there are anti ferromagnetic interactions between these spins that we we'll expect from the Hubble model. And indeed, uh, so uh, one can actually uh, probe the magnetic response of the system using circular dichroism uh, by looking at the difference of the reflection, optical reflection, uh, using left and right circular polarized light uh, as a function of magnetic field. You see a zero field. Uh, time rule symmetry uh, tells you that uh, the left and right circular polarized light uh, give you the same signal. But once apply magnetic field, a small magnetic field like 0.2 Tesla, you see that the X-tone energy peak uh, shifted depending on left or right circular polarized. And uh, uh, if you plot the X-tone energy splitting uh, as a function of magnetic field, uh, you see this interesting uh, contrast. So this red line is without any carriers, without any carriers. Uh, and in this case, you see that the uh, the exon Zeeman splitting is very, very small. And uh, on the other hand, once you go into the model inserting state with one you know, hole per Mori unit cell, you see the exon Zeeman splitting is much, much larger <coughs> and it uh, uh, rises uh, steeply with a prime magnetic field and then eventually saturates. So this behavior is what you expect for the magnetization, the induced spin polarization as a function of the external magnetic field. And one can even look at the slope uh, of this magnetization uh, at the, around zero field, which defines some kind of a spin susceptibility. You plot this as a function of temperature. You see it uh, nicely follows the Curie-Weiss behavior, and the Curie-Weiss constant is negative, telling you there's anti ferromagnetic interactions in the system. Okay. okay, good. Okay, so so far, uh, uh, everything seems to be well understood from the point of view of a triangle lattice Hubble model, uh, but we from very early on, from you know, more than two years ago, uh, we realized actually um, the system can be even more interesting. Yes, Eris? Ah, excellent. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not, and it's just because there's a spin valley locking uh, in the TMDs. So the in-plane magnetic field actually doesn't do anything in these K-valley systems because you cannot uh, you know, uh, couple the two valleys by in-plane magnetic field. Uh, an interesting question is about gamma valley systems. So um, we also worked on the gamma valley systems, and there, uh, the, I think the uh, magnetic response would be would be uh, should be isotropic. Yeah. So what is the, the difference? Is there any uh, orbital effect of magnetic field? So you could you could yeah, but that effect. So for example, right, if you look at uh, the case, the red line without any uh, doping, without any doping, then uh, this exon Zeeman splitting uh, basically comes from the conduction of valence band edge split on the, the magnetic field. And the amount of that splitting depends on the free electron G factor, depends on the optimal magnetic moment. One can include all that, but the point is that that is all very, very small compared to the magnetic response uh, in the modeling state. Yeah. Yes, so Max. With the fact that model, yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's a good, good question. So uh, it turned out in the uh, simplest model, uh, there isn't any because even though the uh, two uh, spin up and spin down states are associated with different values, K and K prime, uh, the dispersion at both K and K prime are just parabolic, right? So, 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 so in this within the simplest uh, description, there isn't there's an emergent spin rotation symmetry. Uh, one can go beyond that, uh, and uh, uh, it turns out that, that, that this is a small effect. So there could be some sort of a, uh, um, some sort of effective magnetic flux, so to speak, within each valley. Uh, opposite fluxes within each valley, but that effect is very small. Yeah. Okay. Or another thing that you know there could be um you can think about barrier curvature effects within each valley, uh, but those barrier curvature are very small because the uh, the parent state is a large gap band insert with a band gap of 1.5 eV. Okay. Okay. Good. So um right. So um from early on uh, we realized that actually uh, if we look at this uh, Moray potential uh, more carefully. So um, if you have a, a potential with a symmetry of a triangle lattice uh, to the leading order, you can express it as a sum of three cosine terms 
uh, where this uh, reciprocalized factor G uh, points in uh, three equivalent symmetry related directions. And, um, uh, but in addition, uh, there is a uh, phase factor phi. Uh, and this phase factor phi, uh, the inside the cosine, that determines uh, the uh, landscape of the potential. And when phi is equal to zero, for example, uh, you find the potential minimum forms a perfect triangle lattice. Okay. Uh, but when phi is actually pi over uh, three, for example, you find that there are two degenerate minimums at the different uh, locations within the unit cell. And this corresponds to a perfect uh, Honeycomb lattice. So for generic uh, phase parameters phi, uh, it's, it's actually in between. Um, and when I say different locations in the uh, unit cell, it actually corresponds to different uh, high symmetry uh, stacking regions. For example, the MM region is where the metal atoms of the two layers are vertically aligned. In the XM region, the X uh, atom of one layer is aligned with the metal atom of the other layer, and the same for uh, MX, right? So depending on the range of parameter phi, so in the range of uh, between zero and pi over six, the potential, there's only one type of potential minimum and that form a triangle lattice. And this is indeed the case for MOSC2, WSC2 uh, studied in Alan's original paper. But for WSC2, WS2, which is uh, what the recent experiments is about, uh, we find that in addition to a uh, primary energy minimum, uh, there's a secondary potential minimum. Uh, and uh, uh, so including both minimums would uh, require a two band model. And uh, uh, this is actually a two band model uh, on the uh, biased uh, honeycomb lattice, honeycomb lattice with an asymmetric uh, potential. And this is the uh, band structure uh, from our uh, large scale DFP calculation uh, by Yang Zhang. And uh, you can see that uh, uh, for example, uh, these two bands, the first and second uh, Maori band, uh, this is well described by a Honeycomb lattice type binding model with a potential difference between A and B sub lattice. So, um, so why this is important? Um, so you might say that uh, if we are at a filling factor below two, uh, only the first band is involved and the first band uh, primarily lives on the uh, uh, triangle lattice potential minimum. And uh, uh, why do I care about this? Well, uh, the, it, there's a big difference once the Hubbard interaction U uh, is introduced. So uh, there are two types of modding series. Uh, the uh, single band Hubbard model really describes a so-called uh, mod Hubbard insider. And in this case, this applies uh, when the second potential minimum is far away in energy, when the Hubbard repulsion U is smaller than the energy difference between the two uh, potential minimums, which I call delta. Um, so for U equal uh, less than delta, um, uh, if you add an additional charge uh, on top of the modding swing states, it's preferable to create double occupancies. And this is you know, all captured by single band Hubbard model. But when uh, the uh, repulsion U is very large, U is bigger than the charge transfer energy delta, then uh, above the filling, half filling, um, an extra charge will actually occupy another uh, sublattice, a different sublattice. And in this case, it uh, leads to a charge transfer insider. And uh, this charge transfer insider actually is, uh, is um, the case for uh, high temperature uh, superconductors. So basically in between the lower and upper Hubbard bands, the, uh, the lower Hubbard band is the uh, band associated with holes. Uh, the upper Hubbard band is a band associated with doublons. But actually the chemical potential sits in between the lower Hubbard band uh, and a, a different a third band, which is called charge transfer band. And this third band actually comes from the second potential minimum, okay, a different, uh, uh, a different atom, so to speak. Okay, and in this case, the insulating gap is uh, set by the charge transfer energy delta instead of the uh, Hubbard U. So uh, we believe that uh, that this charge transfer uh, insulator picture applies to many semiconductor Moray sublattices. And for a while, you know, uh, our work is completely ignored. But finally, uh, the uh, direct evidence of the charge transfer insert came. Um, so this is a twisted WSE2. Uh, and in this systems, when you apply a large electric field, charges are all localized in one layer. So essentially it's a one layer system. Yes, please. What is the magnetic order? That's exactly what this slide is about. Yes, okay. Oh, the question is what is the magnetic order in the charge transfer insert? And this is exactly what I'm talking about now. Yeah, okay. So. Um, so under large electric field, uh, charges still live in one layer. So it's still a one layer system. Um, and uh, so, as I said, in this system, we can change the filling factor continuously from zero all the way to uh, one, where you see a modding filling states. And then further, 
all the way to Green Factor 2. Now, in the single band description, okay, for a mod Hubble insiders, at the filling factor of two, you expect double occupancy at every site. And such a system will have no magnetic moments. On the other hand, in a honeycomb lattice model for a charge transfer insider, at the filling factor one, you have one electron at every uh, primary potential minimum at A site sites. And then if you go to filling factor two, because of large Hubble U, Instead of creating double occupancy on the A sites, you have one electron at every A site and one electron at every B site. And in that case, you still have local magnetic moments at the filling factor two. And this is exactly what's observed, okay? That uh, uh, at the filling factor of two, uh, this uh, measurement of the uh, magnetic circuit dichroism, which tracks the magnetization as a function of external field, you see again the pure wise behavior of the magnetic susceptibility at high temperature. And then uh, the susceptibility starts to drop at low temperature indicating an antiferromagnetic interaction, okay? And again, that's what you expect for Huntington lattice. It's a bipartite lattice, and the, the electrons are closer to each other because it uses both A and B sites. So you expect a much stronger AFM interaction at a fitting factor two compared to the case of fitting factor one, okay? So all this is telling us that uh, at fitting factor one, the electrons uh, occupy the A sites, leading to a charge transfer insider, and doping the further, uh, the doped charge occupy the B sites. Now, with this uh, charge transfer picture, we can uh, look at this MOT to WSE2 system. Uh, this is again where the MOT and the quantum norms Hall state uh, was observed. So, in this system, uh, uh, turned out both layers are actually involved. Okay, so um, this is because the uh, when we look at the uh, intrinsic uh, potential difference between the MOT2 layer and WSE2 layer, this delta essentially is a charge transfer energy. Okay, it's an energy cost associated with transferring charge, uh, not within the same layer, but between the two layers, between the two layers. And uh, the, our DFT calculation says, if you just look at the work function difference for the two layers, uh, there is a charge transfer energy, which is 130 millieV. This is much smaller than the case of WS2, WS2, okay? So then uh, this suggests that when you apply electric field, one can actually tune uh, strongly, strongly tune this charge transfer energy delta, and uh, and this is a way to control the charge transfer energy in the system. Okay, this is something that is hard to achieve in something like cuprates, for example. But in the uh, uh, 2D materials community, uh, the charge transfer energy between the two layers can be tuned by the electric field. So um, um, so now we can look at uh, the uh, the physics of such a charge transfer uh, system. And uh, here are the experimental data. Um, again, let us first look at uh, the case, sorry, sorry, when all the uh, electrons are in one layer, in the MO layer. And uh, uh, so here, the, uh, there's two axes. One axis tunes the feeding factor and the other axis tunes the electric field. Um, so when charges are all in one layer, this is near the top of this figure. And as you change the feeding factor, you go from uh, the no carriers to one, uh, electron per inner cell to two electron per inner cell. And at the fitting factor of two, we expect a bending zero when the first Mori bands is completely filled. And you know this is the, the starting point of our discussion. And uh, if you maintain a fitting factor of two and you increase the electric field between the two layers, you find that the resistance first decreases and then increases again. Okay, there seems to be a transition between two types of insulin states. And this is made more clear by the capacitance measurement of the uh, energy gap at fitting factor of two. You see that the uh, gap uh, closes and then reopens. Okay, so at the uh, bending insider fitting, uh, there's a transition between two types of bending insiders. So um, we uh, studied again using large scale DFT calculation uh, of the Mori bands. And, uh, uh, and uh, so basically, once you put the two layers together, uh, because of the uh, lattice mismatch, a Mori structure forms with a wavelength of about 4.6 nanometers. And um, so because the Mori period is relatively small, the bandwidth is, uh, is, is much larger. So this is far away from the flat bandwidth gene, okay, very different from uh, magic angle graphene. And uh, here there's uh, nothing relies on a special uh, magic angle. So um, in the MOT2, for example, what we first do is to um, just look at the effect of the lattice corrugation uh, on each layers, okay? Uh, we, we put the two layers together, optimize the lattice structure, and then take the two layers apart, maintaining the corrugated uh, structure. So this is a way to help us understand uh, what's going on. 
So we find that in each layer, because of lattice corrugation, you see a whole set of uh, mini bands, uh, mini bands separated by the super lattice gaps. And uh, the bandwidth is the only order of 40 millilitron volt. Uh, and, uh, um, uh, and the band gap, the super lattice gap is only order of about 10 millilitron volt or, or even less. So here, all I want you to pay attention to is that the red and the blue curves are the uh, mini bands from different values. Okay, again, the two values are independent of each other. So let's just focus on uh, from one value, the red curve. You see that um, in the MOT2 layer, the, um, the band top is at a kappa point and band minimum is at a gamma point. Uh, kappa and gamma are the uh, locations in the mini brown zone. And on the other hand, for the WSC2 layer, now the uh, band top is actually at, a, at the gamma point. Okay, and remember that the two layers have actually uh, intrinsic potential difference. So uh, uh, at a large, at a small displacement field, uh, so all the electrons live in the MOT2 layer, okay, uh, with the band edge at gamma. And the unoccupied states is in the WSC2 layer with the band top uh, uh, actually uh, at uh, also, uh, also, sorry, they, so the band minimum is actually at, at kappa prime. And here, uh, unoccupied states, the band top is at kappa prime at the same location. So, um, so then when we change the displacement field, we reduce the charge transfer energy between the two layers. And as you can see now, uh, you can create a band inversion uh, at uh, the mini uh, brillion zone corner. Uh, so there's, uh, for, band, for bands from one given valley, band inversion occurs at a single point, a gamma point in the mini brillion zone. For bands from the other valley, uh, it's time reversal conjugate. So band inversion occurs at another point, kappa prime in the brillion brillion zone. So this is uh, uh, what the DFT calculation shows. And um, uh, without going into the technical details, um, in addition to this banding version, uh, there's a small hybridization between the two layers. And this hybridization has a P wave uh, form factor uh, that creates a topological non-trivial gap. So after banding version, uh, there's a Chen number of opposite sign in the two values, plus one, minus one, of the two values. And this means that at the fitting factor of two, uh, that there's a transition, there's a transition tuned by electric field from a trivial insider into a time reversal invariant uh, topological insider, which is known as a quantum spin hole state. So this not only explains the uh, experiment data, the gap closes and reopens, uh, but also it uh, predicts that after band inversion, there should be helical edge states, and this can be detected by non-local uh, transport, for example, non-local transport, yeah. Okay, so the, um, the more interesting phenomena occurs at the feeling factor of n equal one. So how much time do I have? Okay, that sounds good, yeah. All right, so um, at the fitting factor of n equal one, uh, what experiments observe is a uh, transition is on this line here. You see from a highly resistive state, a modeling swing state into a quantum non hall state where the Hall resistance appears spontaneously without any external magnetic field and it becomes quantized uh, at the low temperature. Okay, so to my knowledge, this is the first and so far the only observation of a transition between a mod and a quantum non hall state. Also notice that there is no hysteresis with respect to the applied electric field. The set at least is consistent with a continuous phase transition. So, um, so in order to understand uh, the physics at uh, fitting factor one, band theory is not going to give us the answer. Band theory will predict half fitting the system is a metal. So we have to think about the interaction effects and in order to deal with interactions in the Amore bands, uh, we, we try to um, downfold the system into a uh, effective type binding model. And um, so basically, uh, so uh, uh, we constructed a type binding model uh, uh, for the, the charges uh, in the MOT2 layer. There's a, the red band is the, so I've done the particle transformation. So instead of talking about holes, let me just talk about the electrons. Uh, there's electron in the MOT2 layer. Uh, there's a, 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 the first Mori band has a dispersion like this. And then there's a Mori band from the WSE2 layer. You see that the band minimum is offset from the gamma, it's at the K. So together, uh, uh, the effective type binding model once again become a Honeycomb lattice, okay? So uh, the A sites are, uh, are to, uh, form a triangle lattice. Uh, it's associated with the MO layer and the B sites form another set of triangle lattice is associated with WSC2 layer. And um, 
uh, there's a, a hoppings uh, within each layer and there's a, a, a interlayer hopping uh, TAB. And uh, in the uh, B layer, uh, there's a spin optic coupling responsible for the fact that uh, the band edge is no longer at the gamma, but at the K point, okay? So these are the, uh, the, all the ingredients of the, uh, of the type binding model. And then on top of this, we add the uh, interaction effects and the predominant interaction effect is just the Hubble U on side repulsion. And this picture summarizes uh, everything I'm gonna describe. Uh, when the interaction is weak, uh, at half fitting, we get a metal. When uh, Hubble U is very, very large, and when the charge transfer energy is also very large, then we basically get a, uh, a, a charge transfer insulator, charge transfer insulator. Uh, the uh, electrons on the A sides uh, at half fitting form a anti ferromagnetic model insulator uh, with a Hubble U, a large energy gap. And as we reduce the charge transfer energy delta, this charge transfer band uh, moves towards the Fermi level, okay? As the charge transfer energy is sufficiently reduced, the energy gap between the charge transfer band and lower Hubble band become inverted, okay? So uh, in this, uh, I'm gonna show that in this inverted regime, uh, this inverted charge transfer insider is actually a quantum non state. Yes? It is 120 degree. That's what I meant by, yeah, by anti Okay, yeah, this is exactly the picture. So um, um, now uh, this is a strongly correlated system. You may ask, you know, is there any reliable way to do an analysis? And uh, I want to argue that in this system, uh, there is a controlled limit where we have a we have a symptomatic exact theory. Okay, so let me first start from this uh, uh, this uninverted regime. Okay, uh, in this charge transfer insider, the uh, magnetic order. Uh, uh, as Nikolai just said, is this 120 degree uh, state. And if we look at the holes in this AFM uh, insulator, it has a dispersion. The detail of the dispersion is unimportant. Uh, all I need you to pay attention to is that uh, the quasi-particle uh, hole band in this 120 degree AFM state is spin polarized and the uh, band edge is at a single point, at a gamma point, okay? And, uh, um, and then on the other hand, the charge transfer band, which is associated with the B sites, because the B sites is unoccupied essentially, so um, it has a spin degeneracy, okay, a spin degeneracy. Uh, it's also located at a gamma point in the magnetic Brillouin zone. Um, yes? Because in the uh, AFM order state, oh, the question is that why, uh, why this spin polarized? Uh, why the um, holes in the dispersion uh, is spin polarized in the, 120 degree AFM state. Because of magnetic order, the spin degeneracy is split. Yeah. Well, in this example, in this case, in this AFM, in this 120 degree non, non collinear state, there isn't. Yeah. If you look at a collinear case, it will be different. Yeah. Okay, good. In fact, that's important. Yeah. The non collinear magnetic order is the starting point of this analysis. Okay. Okay. So now, um, um, so I'm going to focus uh, because banding inversion only involves low energy degrees of freedom. So all the action is going to take place uh, near the gamma point of the magnetic Brillouin zone. So this allows me to go into a continuum uh, description, okay, <coughs> focusing just on the quasi-particle bands uh, near k equals zero. So there's one spin polarized band uh, on the A sides, and there are spin degenerate uh, bands associated with the B uh, sides. One is hole like, the other is electron like. And then there's a hybridization uh, with a, a P wave form factor. Again, that is dictated by the, the magnetic order. Magnetic order still has a three fold rotation symmetry. Now, um, so this is single particle physics all captured uh, by a three by three matrix uh, uh, in the continuum limit. And then on top of that, we should add interaction effects. <clears throat> and it turns out that the only relevant interaction is this uh, dense, dense interaction the Hubbard interaction on the B sides, okay, on the charge transfer band. And um, if you look at the band structure, you find there's a two-fold degeneracy uh, associated with the B sites. This two-fold degeneracy at K equals zero remain protected when we turn on the hybridization between the A and B layers. And that has to do with an exact symmetry. Uh, I'm not going into the details, um, but here is the evolution of the quasi-particle bands 
uh, as I reduce the charge transfer energy delta. Okay, for now, let me keep the interaction G to be zero so I can analyze the band structure by diagonalizing the three by three matrix. And you see that um, as delta is reduced, uh, this band from the B sides comes down in energy and then it swap places with the, uh, the whole band bands on the A sides. So after band inversion, the band ordering goes from a two fold on top of one fold to a one fold on top of a two fold, right? So band ordering uh, changes. And after band inversion, the Fermi level will exactly be at a quadratic band touching points, okay? In the finite range of uh, charge transfer, inverted charge transfer energy range, uh, the, the, there is a quadratic band touching that appears at the Fermi level. And um, it's known that uh, this beautiful work by Barking, Kilson collaborators uh, more than 10 years ago, that this quadratic band touching is inherently unstable to interactions, okay? So in our context, uh, this quadratic band touching uh, comes from the spin degeneracy on the, essentially comes from spin degeneracy on the B sides. So the Hubbard polishing give you an energy splitting and give you a spontaneous energy splitting. And uh, this uh, was exactly what leads to a gap opening at the quadratic band touching points. And, um, and uh, again, once the band gap opens, there's a quantized barrier curvature associated with this gap quadratic band touching points and that leads to a, a turn number. Okay, so uh, basically uh, after band inversion, uh, when uh, the Fermi level sits at the quadratic band touching point, when I include a weak repulsive induction on the B sites, uh, it opens up a magnetic gap. And this magnetic gap uh, uh, at the quadratic band touching points uh, leads to a turn in swing states. It's a quantum non small gap. And um, what's, uh, Important here, uh, uh, like highlight is that, uh, um, so this magnetic ordering um, uh, on the B sides corresponds spin pointing along the Z direction. So in this uh, inverted uh, regime, the A sides spins are predominantly still uh, 120 degree AFM uh, order states, but on the B sides, the spins are pointing in the Z direction. So it leads to now a non co uh spin structure. So, um, uh, uh, the important thing is that the, uh, the change of magnetism from in-plane AFM into a canted uh, AFM, a non coplanar AFM state, this change of magnetism occurs at the same time as uh, gap closing and reopening uh, at the same time with the change of topology. So in that sense, charge and the spin degree are strongly coupled. So, um, so uh, everything so far I've described is based on field theory, invoking only a low energy degree of freedom. Uh, everything is universal. And we also uh, uh, checked by numerical uh, calculations, uh, self-consistent Hartree fork and DMRG, and uh, both calculations uh, indeed support this scenario. And uh, uh, and this uh, in here on the left, I show you the Hartree fork phase diagram as a function of the Hubbard U interaction strength and the uh, the charge transfer energy delta. And you see that uh, there's a uh, for fixed interaction strength U, for example, as I change the charge transfer energy. We can go from the modeling state to a quantum non small state and finally to a metallic state, and that's uh, consistent with experiments. And I um, uh, also want to say that uh, this, our theory is very different from uh, an alternative scenario. Uh, so, for example, in the case of magic angle graphene, uh, the quantum non small state turning insider was also observed, and there it was believed, generally believed, that uh, uh, the physics is coming from the spontaneous full value polarization. Okay. Which corresponds to basic ferromagnetism. Uh, in our picture, uh, uh, the uh, we start from an 120 degree ordered AFM state, and even after band inversion, uh, the magnetic order is still primarily uh, AFM. So, uh, so, and this distant uh, this uh, this can be experimentally uh, uh, tested. So, uh, in our theory, the mod swing state before band inversion should have zero spin polarization. So, if we do the minus of the dichroism, uh, you should not see any signal at the zero field. Uh, in the quantum non small state, there's now a finite SC polarization coming from the MOT2 layer. And, um, but importantly, uh, this SC polarization is far from uh, 100%. So uh, especially near the transition. So uh, immediately after transition into the quantum non small state, the SC polarization is finite, it's actually small. And it should further increases with the displacement field that drives some deeper and deeper 
into the quantum ensemble region. So that's that's a prediction. Uh, so uh, uh, let me just use yeah two minutes to to summarize. Um, so the work, as I said, is motivated by uh, the TMD systems, but I think the message is uh, more general. And uh, 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 so we know, well, you know already for quite some time now that uh, if we deal with um, systems at the even integer fitting, there are different types of bending switches. There's a conventional trivial bending switch, and there's time reversal invariant topological bending switches. And the, uh, the two phases uh, are connected by a bending reversing transition where the um, uh, the direct fermion uh, changes sign. Uh, so uh, what I uh, just described is now a new understanding uh, for a strongly interacting system at all the integer fitting. Okay. At all the integer fitting, interaction can create a model insulin states uh, with a uh, mod Hubbard gap or with a charge transfer gap. Uh, these are interaction induced gaps. These are many body gaps. Um, but by uh, re reducing the charge transfer energy, we can actually invert this many body gap. And this provides a route to uh, topological states uh, in strongly correlated systems. And um, the, these two different uh, uh, theories share a common feature uh, that I'm dealing with a continuous transitions between topological distinct phases, very different from the flat band scenario. Okay, as I said, uh, even to this day, I don't know if we can understand the fractional quantum pulse states from the point of view of uh, a continuous phase transition. Okay, uh, but I think that uh, 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 in the case of modeling series, we, we, we have such an answer now. So, um, uh, so there are many other materials uh, which are charge transfer insiders. And uh, there's even discussion in the literature that charge transfer energy maybe is negative. So it'd be generally interesting to look for topological states in uh, systems with negative charge transfer gap. And also uh, because we start with a, a AFM model insider, uh, AFM model insiders are much more widespread than the ferromagnetic insulating states. And also the AFM uh, transition temperature is intrinsically higher. So this raises the possibility that maybe we can start with a high temperature AFM model insider and we, we tune it in some way, uh, we can induce a high temperature for the non-small state. So back to the, the slide I, uh, I, uh, I showed earlier. So I can say now that the modern QH states uh, can be actually connected and they are actually just steps away from each other. So this is a picture I found online. It turned out that there's a shortest uh, bridge, uh, international uh, bridge connecting two different countries, the two islands, one is in Canada, the other in the United States, and this bridge is only 30 feet long. Okay. So uh, it captures uh, the essence of what I'm saying. Thank you. So questions. Uh, Eris and... I, I understood. So the, the P wave form factor of the, yeah. of the uh, hybridization that just came from the 220 degree uh, that, com order? That, uh, that comes both from the 120 degree order also is related to the single particle hybridization I see. between the two layers. Mm -hmm. So yeah I, yeah, I skipped the technical details. Yeah, yeah and just one very short question. Yeah. Uh, question was the uh, anomalous quantum Hall state uh, in, in, uh, in, 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 the uh, whole whole connectivity was actually observed in, in this intermediate state, the, the, the gap state. I mean, the uh, so just make sure I understand the question. So the, uh, the 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 yeah, I mean the data. Yeah, this is this is a quantized Hall effect. Yeah, at zero field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. It's, it's quantized. Yeah, right. that's the motivation for right. this work. And actually, back to your first question uh, about the why is key waveform factor. There's actually one way to understand this is that. Um, yeah, so let me just show you this slide. Yeah, so one can look at the, uh, the, the symmetry eigen values of these bands. Uh, it turns out that, that uh, there are in total three bands here, right? And uh, it turns out all these three bands have a different uh, uh, C3 eigen values. And the, uh, uh, the, the difference in the uh, C3 eigen value is such that the matrix them between the red band to one of the blue band has a form factor of P plus IP and to the other, is P minus IP. Yeah, so it's sort of dictated by the C3 eigenvalue. And here, when I say C3 eigenvalue, I have to rotate both space coordinates and the spins. Yeah, because in this uh, 120 degree order state, the spin and the lattice are locked together. So, so on the transition, so can I think of it in, uh, that you find the uh, mode two? 
yeah. uh, QAH so that uh, you sp the transition corresponds to ferromagnetic order in on the yes, B side, B, B side, on B side. which polarize in, in the, 120 degree structure on A side. Yes, yes. So after B size developer FM are ordering the Z direction, we expect generally the A sides should also count. In terms right. of symmetry, they, they should. But so, but so, and this is, I mean, by increasing field, the electric field, you can increase that polarization. Yes, right? yes, absolutely. Yeah. So you can drive to non trivial states of the A side as well. Uh, yes, yeah, as well. Yes, yes, yes. agree. Yes. Do you think directly that uh, you account for the 120 degrees order just by in min field yeah. uh, to have then single particle description, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, and then after that, uh, when you have the degenerate uh, quadratic touching of the right. bands and interaction, uh, it I think it should be different from uh, bilayer graphene without twist. I mean, without. It, Graphene without twist. To, to, right. So, to yeah, a. this is an excellent question. Yeah. So, uh, there is a, actually there must be some difference, right? Yeah, so, there's an important difference. Yeah. yeah difference okay. in the following. So, you see, uh, so in bilographene, the quadratic band touching, uh, there are in total four full degeneracy, right? There's K and K prime values, and there's a spins. There's spin. So, that leads to many competing instabilities. Right. Okay. And uh, so, you know, I remember like you know, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of discussion, you know, which instability wins, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I don't know if it's settled today or not, but a uh, nice thing is here in this system, right? Um, there's only a two fold degeneracy, spin degeneracy. There's no additional value degeneracy. So there's only one type of uh, relevant interactions. And, and that's why it's, uh, yeah, the, the unstable state is unique. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Online, but uh, if I understood correctly, the quadratic band touching being at uh, near the Fermi energy is important in your story. It's important, right? yeah, yeah. So in the work that you referenced, there's some symmetry that pins the quadratic band touching to the Fermi level. In your work, is there some symmetry that pins it or is, yeah, is yeah, it actually, accidental? Yeah. So uh, there are two questions. One is uh, why the quadratic band touching, the two-fold degeneracy is there and that requires a symmetry, right? So uh, in this work by uh, uh, you know, this uh, Yao Hong and uh, Kai Sun and collaborators, uh, they were dealing with a spinless model, and uh, the two-fold degeneracy is protected by uh, lattice rotation symmetry and the spinless time reversal symmetry. Uh, in uh, my case, uh, this two-fold degeneracy is protected by a different symmetry. Um, the lattice has a three-fold rotation symmetry, and uh, moreover, I'm not dealing with a spinless case. The physical electrons really carry spin. Uh, but it turns out, uh, in this uh, AFM 120 degree order states, the spins lie in the xy plane. So you can define a time reversal symmetry combined with a, a spin rotation by 120 degree around the z-axis. So it's, we can write as T and SZ, the product. So this magnetic order breaks uh, time reversal. Uh, uh, so you know, time reversal is lost, but you can combine time reversal with a, a pi rotation of spin along z-axis, right? Because time reversal flips the spin and the SZ rotation restores it. So the combination of time reversal and SZ is an anti-unitary operator and it actually squares to plus one because T squares to, um, to um, plus one and uh, uh, the spin rotation square also to minus one, right? Because, uh, you know, spin rotation by, if you rotate a spin by two pi, it actually is minus one. So combining the two, the product of time reversal and uh, pi rotation of spins uh, give you an anti-unitary uh, symmetry, which is squared to minus one. So this actually uh, behaves in the same way as a spinless time reversal symmetry. So combining this, these two symmetries, it protects a two-fold degeneracy. Yeah. Well, the, the, set, the second question is why it's pink. It's never pink. So what happened, that, uh, the question really is that uh, why the grab band touching uh, appears at the Fermi level, right? So, uh, so this is guaranteed by the fitting factor because I'm dealing with uh, the case of uh, one electron per unit cell. The fitting factor dictates that this grab band touching has to be at the Fermi level. Uh, and in this range, in this range, because if you go to the deeply inverted regime, you find the band structure is like this. So then to maintain a fitting factor one, you can have spontaneous electron in the whole pocket, right? So that's why in the deeply inverted regime, despite the correct band touching is still there, uh, you're not, it's not at the Fermi level, but uh, in a finite range of the uh, band inversion, uh, the band structure is such that uh, this, there's, you know, there's no negative curvatures. So uh, the uh, fitting factor one, uh, 
uh, it implies that crab hatching has to be at some level. Yes. Okay, so I'm reading uh, uh, online questions. Uh, could you once more review your evidence that the transition is continuous? Yeah. Do you know what the universality class is? Yeah, do that's actually. Do you inherit the universality of the underlying magnetic ordering transition? So this is an excellent question. So, um, so yeah. So okay. So uh, let me. Uh, yeah. So um, the transition is continuous is because um, uh, there's only. Um, so here, you know, what I'm uh, showing is uh, the band structure in the absence of impact chains, right? So everything is continuous, obviously here, because I'm just tuning the single particle band structure. The question is what happens in the presence of interactions. So this interaction um, is, uh, you know, before banding inversion, there's an energy gap. So weak interaction is not relevant. Uh, after banding inversion, there's a band touching appearing at the Fermi level, and there's only one type of instability, and that is uh, due to this interaction. Okay, so, uh, so that's why, uh, so in other words, this interaction changes from irrelevant to relevant as I tune the uh, banding version. So what so, about universality class? Yeah, I think it's new. It's really new type of uh, uh, system uh, situation. Uh, the closest analogy I can think of is the KT transition. So if you think about a 1D stringless uh, system uh, and uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the ohm club scattering, right? it's, uh, it's uh, irrelevant in certain range of Latinger parameters and they become relevant. Uh, once the Latinger parameter becomes in the right range. So the situation analysis here that the uh, Hubble interaction G is irrelevant before banding inversion, but it changes to being relevant after banding inversion. So it's- So there's an online um, you know, audience raising a hand, Marco uh, Greeley. Yes, hi, uh, I'm Marco Greeley from yeah. home. Yes. yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Uh, hi, um, I have a question because uh, from the coup rates, we learned uh, the lesson that uh, usually when strong correlation tends to suppress and reduce the kinetic energy, but still there are phononic or magnetic uh, interactions lur lurking around, uh, the system often gets prone to phase separation and then long range Coulomb repulsion leads to the standard story of frustrated phase separation with the stripe, Chardesky wave formation and so on. Now I was wondering whether there is any fundamental reason why moving slightly away from n equal one in this case of Moiré system, the system should be protected against phase separation. Or you still think that there is some Maxwell construction uh, splitting the system into regions with n equal one and regions with n one plus something, and yeah, then a, still uh, yeah. valid in n equal one regions. What do you- Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah, so uh, uh, let me clarify, you know, uh, you know, uh, what you describe is basically doping a modern insulator uh, uh, away from right. the factor one. Right. Yeah. Here, uh, I'm talking about the case of inverting a modern insulator. The feeding factor is always at one. Yeah, 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 this is clear. So my question was related to what would happen if you move just slightly away from it. Right, so yeah, actually there are some very uh, interesting experimental data uh, that uh, I, I don't know, maybe still not published, but, uh, but it's being talked about uh, in, in public. Uh, it, doping the system away from uh, n equal one it leads to a fascinating uh, phenomenon. Basically, there uh, seems to be a ferromagnetism looking around, and uh, there's a heavy Fermi liquid. So there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, physics when you dope it away from feeling factor one. Yeah, that still needs to be understood. Okay. So exactly the transition, you have three bands touching, yeah. is it right? Yeah. And two of them are linear and one is quadratic, That's is right. it right? Yes. So, so are interactions are irrelevant? It's an excellent question. So this is exactly what we uh, spend some time on. So uh, so yeah, uh, it turned out at this uh, band touching point, as you said, there's a one uh, linear uh, uh, band touching and there's a quadratic band touching. We found that interaction is irrelevant. One way to think about this is that, uh, you know, when you say interaction is uh, uh, relevant uh, or marginally relevant, uh, it always involves some diverging susceptibility right, in some channel. So we checked for this uh, in the non-intacting uh, uh, susceptibility and we found no divergence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's because the linear dispersion does not give you a finite dynamic state, right? So we know that interaction is irrelevant at the yes. drag point. Now there is a quadratic band touching, but this quadratic band touch, there is a quadratic band that band, but it, it only has band bottom touches the Fermi level, right? So there's no field Fermi C, yeah. So so we we, we check there's no divergence of any kind. So it's, yeah. Sorry, just one last question. 
Uh, can you say a few words about what the density of states is near that touching? Because uh, near a linear uh, touching, you would you would expect a Vano point, and when you have quadratic touching bands, you have a power law Vano so point. So right? it's it's well yeah. So it's a it's a sum, right? There's a for the linear dispersing band, it gives you a tensor state that's like this, and then uh, for the uh, quadratic band touching, it gives you a tensor state that's uh, that is like this right? for quadratic band. Right? So you take the sum of the two. Yeah, so there's yeah. So we just have uh, short discussions for the questions of all the morning talks, but we are running a little bit uh, behind the schedule. So what do you think? Uh, just a couple of short questions or uh, we leave this to the lunch. Oh yeah, so uh, there may be questions to uh, Professor Falco's talk or or Eris Berg's talk. Um, so we could spend a couple of minutes here. Uh, are there questions? to the earlier talks this morning. Any questions online? Not yet, okay. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is to Liam. Uh, so so when, when, you, when you showed the susceptibility, uh, it had a QD law behavior at high temperatures, but then uh, it deviated from Curie law. And I 